Hi, my name is Jim Folk, and I am the president of AnxietyCenter.com. Uh, today, I'm joined with Sherry Vincent, one of our seasoned anxiety disorder therapists. Sherry, it's great to have you with us. Good morning. Hi, Jim. It's nice to be here. I'm, I'm excited to have a chance to talk about these things today. Yeah, me too. Uh, I know uh, uh, we've worked here for a long time in the field of anxiety disorder, but our topic today is slightly different. But before we get there, can you tell me a little bit about, about your background, your training, your experience with anxiety disorder, and so on, just to give the viewers an opportunity to get to know you? Sure. Yeah. Um, anxiety has been a part of my life for as, as long as I can remember in one way or another. Um, when I was young, I had um, anxiety uh, all through my childhood years and in my early adult years, um, quite severe towards the end. Um, and I remember I used to tell people, you know, I was born anxious. And I really believed that. I thought it was true. Um, and it took, uh, it took the condition getting it's extreme for me to really do something about it and learn that it had nothing to do with me being born born with it. It had to do with all the things I had learned without realizing, um, and and my reactions were actually causing causing my condition. So um, I, I had a lot to learn, and I, there were a lot of I had to get a lot of help, and I had to seek that out in in many places, which um, is one of the things I love about Anxiety Center because. It really has everything I would have needed back then in one location. Whereas when I when I had to get well, I had to search, you know, from person to person to find little bits here and there of what could help me me get well. So, and and once I was there, I really wanted to be able to help other people to get there as well. And so um, I couldn't imagine um, standing by knowing that someone was suffering with anxiety and not doing anything about it. So um, I I have I went back to school and um, I got my, my master's in marriage and family counseling and um, I began work with um, Anxiety Center shortly after that which is some years ago now um, and I love my job it's something that you know I love the connections with the clients I love the fact that they bless me by allowing me to be a part of their journey and, and get well um, it's it's such an amazing thing to be a part of to watch them work um, and, and get themselves better. It's really, truly an amazing thing. And, and so after that, or was it before you had your training? Like what motivated you to work with people? Um, well, I, I wanted to do something about it, right? You know, even before I went back to school for my, for my uh, master's degree, I, I wanted to be able to help people that had been in the same situation that I had been in. And I knew that it had nothing to do with if you were strong, it had nothing to do with if you were smart, it had nothing to do with anybody can, can get anxiety. And so I wanted that, you know, to be able to help people that were there just like I was and felt like there was nowhere to go. There was no hope and there was no way to fix this when there really is. So, um, yeah, I really, ever since I got well is really when I wanted, wanted to work with people with anxiety. So everything really fell into place for me, which was, was a real blessing because I, you know, I was able to start that as kind of the focus of my career, right from almost the very beginning. Well, we're certainly blessed to have you as, part of our team are recommended therapists, I can tell you that. And you're such an amazing person. We're going to get to that in a moment, and I'll tell you why. But, you know, uh, you have extensive background in anxiety disorder and helping people. But there's another story that needs telling. And so do you want to tell us a little bit about how this all came about? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I, I have Lyme disease. I have uh, third stage neural Lyme disease um, with several co-infections. But um, to make a long story short, um, I was kind of hit with this about two and a half years ago. Um, I woke up in the night and I thought I'd been coming down with a cold the night before and so I went to bed early. Uh, woke up in the night and hit the floor because I couldn't stand. Um, half of my body was numb and I was very, very dizzy. And so we went to the hospital. Uh, I was, you know, sent for an M MRI. A stroke was ruled out. All these things were ruled out. And I was sent home and told, well, you, you probably have a virus. It's probably caused some nerve damage. And over time, that will get well. You know, you'll get well from that slowly because nerves heal slowly. Um, and a little bits of it might be left, but it'll be fine. But over time, I didn't get better. Um, I kept having, you know, I wasn't as severe as that first uh, um, episode, but I didn't get better. And I had 
you know, strange symptoms and, you know, I, I had, uh, problems with my coordination. I had problems with my vision. Um, I had, I had a lot of pain, severe pain, nerve pain. Um, and so, and it, it didn't go away. And so I sort of thought, well, I'm going to live with this. Um, and, and, uh, they suggested maybe it was MS. There were a lot of things that, you know, happened in the beginning when no one knew what it was, but in the end they just said, well, we don't know. Um, this is, you know, you're just going to have to, to go home and learn to live with it. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. And so you went through the traditional route uh, and then what happened? Obviously that wasn't the end of the story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, um, I was desperate for pain relief and, and not wanting to use uh, narcotics. I, I thought, well, I'm going to go to a naturopath and just see if there's anything they can do. Um, and so the naturopath that I saw, he suggested, he looked at me, he was not even five minutes. And he said, you have Lyme disease. He knew right away. And he said, we need to send your blood to the US and get it tested there. Um, there's a different, uh, well, Lyme hadn't even been suggested to me yet at this point, but, but there's uh, good quality testing in the US for Lyme disease. So that's where we sent, sent my blood and it came back off the charts. So then I knew I had third stage Lyme and that, some, that I had to do something about it soon because uh, like a lot of people don't know, Lyme disease kills when you, when you get to third stage. So treatment is required if you want to make it. Wow. Jeez. And so, uh, and what did you do for a treatment? Could you get that treatment in Canada? Did your doctor in Canada confirm it? Like what else happened? Um, I didn't get the, the test result confirmed in Canada. I have had since a test done here, but, um, the, the tests in Canada are, um, quite unreliable. They're about 70% when it comes to false negatives. So a lot of people are missed. Only um, one strain of Lyme disease, uh, well, there's debate on that, one or two strains of Lyme disease are being tested through with the Canadian test. Mm. Um, it's actually linked to uh, the fact that there used to be in trials a vaccine for Lyme disease. And so the choice was made not to test for the two most common strains. So the test actually doesn't cause test the most common strains in Canada. So it misses a lot. Um, in addition, the longer you're sick, the less likely you are to test positive for the disease. Um, and wow. and in, a, in addition, the further west you are in Canada, the less likely you will test positive. So that puts me in a, in a pretty bad place for the Canadian test. But um, mm -hmm. I know from, I've had it confirmed from um, internationally accredited lab in Germany as well. So I know for sure that I, you know, that the test results from the U.S. were accurate. Wow. Gee. Yeah. And based on the test results, uh, so what treatments often uh, have you had or are you falling through? I understand you're still going for treatment. Yes, I am. Um, traditionally, what's normally done in Canada and what is the, the best thing to be done if you catch Lyme disease in the first six weeks, um, six weeks of antibiotics will will kill it and you won't be sick. Um, it'll, it'll do what it needs to do and you'll be good to go. But if you go past that six weeks, you end up in um, the second stage of Lyme disease, which, uh, which often is called functional Lyme. And that's when you have a lot of symptoms, but they're, um, they, they're bothersome. They might be painful. It's no fun by any stretch, but the Lyme isn't winning yet. It's, uh, you know, it's there, but it's, it's not winning. Third stage where I am is, is kind of where, um, they would say the Lyme is winning over your body. So um, when I looked for treatment, I knew that the six weeks of antibiotics wouldn't, wouldn't be helpful. The Lyme spirochetes, they actually, um, they form little cysts within your body and they can actually hide in there from the antibiotics mm. once you're in, you know, in a later stage. So something more was needed. So I looked for um, treatment outside of Canada where, um, where there, it is available. Um, the first people to start treating Lyme disease uh, were in Germany quite some years ago now. It's been, it's been quite a while that they've been treating Lyme disease successfully there. They have an 80% success rate. Um, so that's where I went. And I went there uh, for two weeks in December and I'm going, and then I had six months of follow-up medication here at home. And then I'm going again now for some additional treatment. Um, I'm leaving at the end of this week. So I'm going back for uh, treatment again. Wow. My gosh, I, I uh, said you were an amazing woman because, you know, all the years we've been working together as part of the team, you had mentioned 
you had Lyme, but you never mentioned how severe it was and all the things you've been through. You're a real trooper that way where, my gosh, uh, you know, uh, just be to remain so silent on it. So I'm glad you're coming forward now and letting other people know. As I understand it, you know, Lyme is really misunderstood in Canada and uh, a lot more could be done. So just to help people understand some of the, you know, uh, more informational levels of the Lyme, do you have some things you want to say to them that's probably not commonly known? Definitely, absolutely, and and thank you for that. I know I don't I don't say a lot about the struggles that I go through with Lyme disease because you hardly say anything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think okay, we're all well, surprised I, when you mentioned it. <laughs> I um okay, so I I don't say I hardly say anything, and it's because <laughs> um it's because Lyme disease really um is just a part of it's a part of what's going on in my life and I refuse to let it define me. I'm still going to do my work. I'm still going to be a mom. I'm still going to, I'm still going to have my life. And yes, I've had to make some changes because of that, of Lyme disease. And I've had to do things differently, but I refuse to let it, I refuse to let it take, take over my life. So that's why I don't talk about it a lot um, in terms Mm -hmm. of how, what I have to do and the adjustments I have to make in order to, you know, keep functioning and all of that. That's why I don't mention it, but I do uh, feel like it's really important to get the message out there to people about Lyme disease because um, very little is known and there's a lot of false information out there. Um, For starters, many people don't know that Lyme disease is, is carried by not just deer ticks, but all ticks. It's just that deer ticks are more likely to carry Lyme. Um, The tick does not need to stay on your body for 48 hours. As many people believe Um, you don't need to get a bullseye rash. Often with Lyme disease, you can get a bullseye rash around the tick bite area, but over half the people who have Lyme never had that rash. So if you don't have the rash, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have Lyme. Um, Lyme disease is also now being carried by horse flies, spiders, and mosquitoes. So it's not only coming from ticks. While it's mostly coming from ticks, you know, you can get it other ways. So that's important to know too. And Lyme is a, is a bloodborne disease. So you can pass it to your spouse and you can pass it to your unborn child. So those are things that people often aren't aware of either. And so if Lyme is dormant and you have a child, for example, your child can be born with Lyme disease, even though you've never had a symptom. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it's really important for people to be aware of the dangers and take it seriously. Absolutely. So if a person is suspicious they have Lyme, when should they go to the doctor and what should they be looking for? Okay, if you're suspicious you have Lyme, time is of the essence. The fastest you, you, the faster you can get to the doctor, the better, because we're looking at, you know, that first six week window, if you catch it in there and you get started on antibiotics and you take your antibiotics for six weeks, doxycycline, 200 milligrams a day is what's recommended by um, the research. Um, If you do that, uh, chances are you won't have any any problems at all. You can get rid of it and go on with your life. So go there quickly. Um, things to look for, uh, fever, um, any problems with, uh, with vision, um, things like dizziness, weakness, uh, paralysis on, you know, in a part of your body. Um, fever though is, is the predominant one in those early stages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're just not feeling quite right, um, the summer I believe I was bit, I had fevers on and off that whole summer and, and I didn't know what it was. And I, and I didn't, pay much attention to it either. I didn't say I'm not one to rush to the doctor. So I didn't really worry about it. I thought, well, I'm going away each time. So, you know, it's probably no big deal. In reality, it was Lyme disease. And so Mm. that doesn't mean that I would have been treated because, you know, most doctors don't have, you know, all the information that it would be nice for them to have. So I I may not have been diagnosed, but I might have been. So, you know, Mm. it is important to be aware of that. Gotcha. Sure. Now, like anxiety disorder, um, like anxiety disorder suffers often suffer in silence. We say some things and people really don't get a grasp of how serious the condition can affect us. And I'm assuming very similar to Lyme. Can you sort of give the viewers an indication of what you actually went through, some of the struggles you had, the symptoms you had, how pervasive it was on your health and your family? Sure, absolutely. My my first uh, attack with Lyme was um, so bad that I I almost lost all of my vision. So I had very very little vision, uh, maybe ten or twenty percent. 
um, I was dizzy all the time. So I had, I, I couldn't really walk, uh, unaided. I definitely couldn't. Um, I couldn't sleep. That's another symptom of Lyme disease early on. I would go days without sleeping. I couldn't lay down because I would be so dizzy. And this initial phase lasted about six weeks. Um, and then I got on some medication for some of the symptoms. I take seizure medication and I take, um, some other medications that help with the symptoms, but it, you know, it doesn't cure the Lyme. And so once, um, my symptoms were being managed, um, better, I could start to, you know, function like, you know, a regular human being again and do the things that, that, that I used to do, but, but it has changed for me because I don't have the, the energy that I used to have. I don't have the mobility that I used to have. Um, I don't drive anymore. Um, I'm hoping to get that privilege back. Mm -hmm. Um, but at this stage I can't. So, um, other people drive me places and, um, it's no different. I know than than things that, you know, many people suffer because of other conditions like, you know, paralysis or MS or, I mean, there are many reasons why people have to give these kind of things up and it's, it's tough to say, okay, I've got so much energy in a day. I've got so much I can give. Where do I put that? I can't do it all anymore. I, I can't, you know, I can't try to be superwoman. I just have to say, okay, this is how much I've got to give and this is where I'm going to put my energy and, and make decisions. And I've given a lot up because of that. But like I said, Lyme, I refuse to let it define me. And so I'm not going to, I'm going to make changes where I need to, but, um, yeah, it's not going to win. Wow. Yeah. So you've endured quite a lot. Uh, I'll bet you your anxiety coaching skills have really been a help to you to cope with what you've been dealing with. Absolutely. Absolutely. They have been, um, because, you know, it's, it would be easy to think in the, you know, in terms of, oh, it's going to be like this forever, or there's no chance that I'll ever um, get better, or nothing will ever change. Or if I have to make some adjustments, that means it's all over for me. And my life, you know, as as is gone, essentially, it would be so easy to fall into those traps. Um, but uh, I work really hard not to allow that to happen. And definitely having um, the the practice and the skills that, that come along with the work that I do, I, I'm able to turn those back on myself and make sure that I don't you know, fall into those traps. And I'm not saying that I've never been upset about this or this hasn't, you know, you know, kind of devastated our family from time to time because it has, it absolutely has. I'm not the same person that I was in many ways. And so there's been a huge adjustment, but, um, but the, the more you can look at it as something that you can use um, in a good way somehow, um, I believe that I thought I was an empathetic person before. Um, and I think I was, but I'm much, much more empathetic now because of what I've been going through. And so, so there are benefits to this as well. There are things that I have because of this that I didn't have before. Sheesh. Now your treatment that's coming up, the first round of what you're going through was a challenge. It wasn't easy treatment by any stretch of the imagination. And you're going back again in hopes that this is now going to finally put this uh, to bed once and for all, correct? Yes, that's, that is the hope. Um, I, 80% of people that, that go to Germany for the treatment that I'm going for, which the prim primary part of it is hyperthermia. They heat your body up to uh, 41.5 degrees, leave you there for several hours, and then bring your temperature back down. You're um, asleep. You're out like in an OR for the, the whole time because you wouldn't be able to tolerate that, that high of a body temperature without seizures and all and different things. So, um, so you're asleep for it, uh, that kills the spirochetes. And so, um, 80% of the people who go and do this, it's twice in the space of two weeks. And then they also give antibiotic therapy. So it's augmented by that, which, um, the, when the antibiotics are hot, they are, actually about a thousand times more effective against Lyme, which nobody really knows why, but that's how it works out. So mm -hmm. it's really helpful to do the, do the both together. So we do that as well. And then there are different therapies that they do to in between to help out this time. I'm also, um, I'm getting, uh, it's kind of, it's similar to uh, bone marrow transplant, but they don't do the, the chemo part. So they're just using your own, your own stem cells and putting them back in, um, 
to your to where your blood is is um i don't know what the word is uh made i guess mm. <laughs> they put it like into the middle of your bones or um and uh but it's your own stem cells and then that helps to regenerate your your blood cells because mine right now every single one of them are you're misshapen my red blood cells are all misshapen and that's an effect of the lime and it makes my blood kind of stringy and clumpy which is really unhealthy and bad for your heart um so among other things but so mm. this helps with that so i'm also getting that this time and extensive blood cleansing as well i do uh, plasmapheresis which is it's kind of like um, dialysis only it's it's much much stronger than that like it really clears everything out of your blood stream so that too wow yeah my gosh and so the treatment you're going for now is for how long how long do you have to be there um i'll be there for two weeks um i of course there's travel time there and back but i will be at the hospital for exactly two weeks and um judging from last time i will be in treatment pretty much every second of every day yeah. like they start you early in the morning and you're doing some kind of treatment for the entire day so it uh you're really busy when you're there there's not a lot of you know kind of relaxation or downtime even on the weekends there you know i get there on a sunday and they start right when i arrive so so it's really busy actually which is good because they're packing a lot into the two weeks that you're there so that you don't have to be there for a long time that's what makes this this treatment also quite nice is that you can go for two weeks, come back, do your six months of follow-up treatment at home, and it doesn't have to disrupt your life. You know, you can still have a job. You can still, you know, it's, I guess, like taking a holiday only a little more painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, right. <laughs> and how long will it be after this treatment will you know the treatment's effect? Well, six months is when you're supposed to test again. So, um, and so... I guess in six months, technically I'll know, but I'll know sooner than that how it's going. You know, after last time there were, there were improvements and I knew that very soon after. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure that it'll be similar this time as well, but technically it's six months until you can actually, you know, do the blood test to show. And it's not, they don't do a Lyme test because, you know, once you've had Lyme disease, there's always going to be some indication of that um, in your in your system. So what they do is the CD5657 test, which shows how much inflammation is in your body. And so essentially when you have Lyme disease, that's what causes your inflammation. So they check mm -hmm. to make sure you don't have any other diseases. Um, and I've been for many scans and everything, uh, bone scans, PET scans, everything to make sure there's nothing else going on. So this way they'll know for sure if the CD5657, you know, comes down, then they know that it's worked. So. Okay, great. Well, as you know, there's a lot of people praying for you. Yeah, certainly yes. wanting the best for you. Now, the treatment you're going through is rather expensive. Can you give us a sense of how expensive? Yeah, it's it's about the treatment itself is about thirteen thousand euros, which is more than thirteen thousand Canadian dollars. By the time you're finished with flights, medication, and the treatment, uh, the medication for the six months and the treatment, it's about fifty thousand Canadian dollars. Wow. For yeah, so that's for the two weeks there and the six months of follow up. Right, and because this treatment, well, not only is good diagnosis not available in Canada. But treatment's not available in Canada. So does any of your Canada health insurance cover any of your expenses? No, not at all. Because any private health health insurance that somebody anybody would have in Canada um, will cover the rest of something that isn't covered in Saskatchewan, but is like a or a, or a provincial wherever, wherever province you're in, provincially approved treatment. So because we don't have anything here, um, the or even our our private insurance doesn't cover the extra, but our but with Saskatchewan, there's absolutely nothing covered at all. Wow. Yeah. Well, I have a few more questions, uh, mm -hmm. but before we get there, um, being an anxiety therapist, can you uh, let some of the anxiety clients know the difference between symptoms of anxiety and symptoms of Lyme? Yeah, I think that's a really important question because um, having had both uh, Lyme disease and anxiety, I would never mistake one for the other. Um, to me, it's clear as day that, that they're not the same. And never for a second did I think, oh, my anxiety's come back. Like I didn't even have that thought. I knew I knew that it was something else. Now, it's a little more complicated if you haven't 
if you don't know and you haven't had both, how do you tell? You know, if you, you read the symptoms on paper, oh, dizziness, okay, yeah, like visual disturbance, yes, okay, I have that. That might sound like, yes, you have Lyme disease. Um, I think it's really important to note that with Lyme disease, the symptoms are, are there. And so if you're not, fe with anxiety, if you're feeling anxious, you get more symptoms. And, and so you tend to have these ups and downs. You have the symptoms, then they go, then they come, then they go. With Lyme disease, it's not like that. If, if you feel more anxious, you're not going to have more symptoms than if you feel less anxious or, mm. um, you know, so your symptoms are going to be there. Um, it, there is a little bit of a cyclical nature to Lyme, but it tends to be around, um, it tends to be about once a month and that's just the life cycle of the Lyme bug and so again that's much more predictable than with anxiety with anxiety you know it's going to fluctuate a lot more than that um, another key one is fevers um, Lyme disease causes um, fevers and so um, it's usually pretty clear early on you know severe fevers and all that 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 that's not really something that you would line up with the beginning of an anxiety condition. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, to me, it's, it's quite clear. And, and the biggest thing is if it's connected to your emotions and well, I don't, I'm not happy that I have Lyme disease. There's no connection between how I'm feeling. Um, if I'm having negative or positive thoughts and what symptom is showing, I can be as happy as anything at one of, at my child's birthday party and have severe symptoms. So, you know, it just, yeah, there's, to me, there's no comparison. It's very obvious, but I can certainly understand how it would be confusing when you're looking at both on paper because they do sound similar. Sure, absolutely, yeah. And if a person is, you know, still questioning, one of the best things to do is probably connect with you. You'd be able to tell them right away what the differences are. I mean, because you have firsthand experience with both, you would know which one would be which. So that would be helpful there. Um, another question here too is, what can Canada do differently to help people with Lyme? That's also a very good question. And I'm hoping that we're at the beginning of some changes happening. There are a lot of people advocating for change and um, it's, it's starting to look like it might be having an effect, which would be a wonderful thing. But what really needs to happen is we need to have better testing. Our, test, our tests need to not have a 70% false negative rate. That's just crazy when out there, there are other options for testing um, that are more accurate. So um, we need better testing. We also need education because the what people were taught years ago even for doctors perhaps when they were in medical school are some of those fallacies that I mentioned earlier like having to have the bullseye rash or having to have the tick on for 48 hours those kind of things in the in the medical profession right now most doctors and nurses have the old information in their minds from when they were trained and so I think education is really important and awareness um, is important too and especially because this is an epidemic that's growing fastest the fa it's the fastest epidemic growth with growth in the world that wow. didn't sound very clear it's the fastest growing epidemic in the world it has wow. even surpassed HIV AIDS now so wow and so, you know, comments like yours, uh, I know you did an interview with CTV, uh, raising awareness about it all can help uh, those in Canada, especially if it's a fast growing epidemic, you know, Canada needs to be on top of this. And there's probably a lot of people who are suffering in silence or whatever. So, you know, uh, people like yourself doing what you can to raise awareness is very helpful. Now, again, you have uh, an expensive trip coming up, um, uh, being an anxiety therapist, you know, who works with us at anxietycenter.com you generally only charge enough to make a living. You don't charge, you know, we're not charging to get wealthy or others. So coming out of pocket is a bit of an issue of taking all that money you mentioned and paying it out of pocket. So there are those who would like to help you. And I know someone has set up a GoFund page for you. And so at the end of our conversation, we're going to post that link. So people who are interested in helping out can do that. Is there any other resources that you recommend for people who are dealing with Lyme or may think they have Lyme and what they can do about it? There are various websites that um, that you can go to. Um, the the one that um, is very good is uh, murakami.org. Uh, it's a it's a website written by a, a doctor in Canada who specializes in the study of Lyme disease. Um, his website is a really really good one to go to, um, and. 
just just get educated because there's so much out there. Um, look into the testing, look into the differences between what Canada does for a test, which is the ELISA and Western DOT and, or um, Western Blot, and then the other tests that they do in, overseas. So check, check that out, see what the differences are and, and see why it's important to have good testing. And um, really, really important to educate yourself on the symptoms, um, what you're what you're seeing your body go through if you think you may have Lyme, um, because the knowledge is just not out there. So the best thing you can do for yourself is to is to just go to some of these more reputable sites and and really see what you can find out. There are also Facebook pages. Um, there's all there are all kinds of resources because the movement really is out there uh, to to see change because. Um, you, the U.S. it needs a lot of change as well. They have better testing than we do, but um, as far as providing treatment, they have very little. They're very similar to Canada in that respect. So, um, change is is needed, you know, across North America. So, um, there's a lot of really good information out there because of that. So, just getting educated, I think, is really important. Super, and then that also having those who are educated tell their doctors about it and trying to encourage them to get educated as well. I imagine would be helpful. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, sometimes it, it can be difficult doing that because um, when you come with new information to uh, healthcare providers, that can be a difficult thing. But I would really encourage people to, to do that anyway because it's for your health and it's, you know, or your children's health and it's just very, very important. It, this is a disease that is is difficult. It's no fun. And if you can catch it in the early stages, it's worth it's worth pushing a little bit to make that happen. Sure, you bet. I know you know there's kind of two sets of doctors. I know this is a generalization, but you have the one doctor who believes they know it all and sort of doesn't really listen to their patients that much when they come forward with information like this. Then you have the other doctor who's really sympathetic and eager to help and is willing to listen and read. So for those who are maybe are working with the first kind of doctor, it might be helpful to, for them to find a second kind to help them move through this because. Like anxiety disorder, Lyme can have yeah. profound impact on your life. And as you mentioned, you know, the consequences could be very dire in those cases. So completely agree. And I think there is a similarity with anxiety when you when we talk about the type of doctor that that people are going to see. I, I hear similar problems with anxiety as well. When patients um, bring information to their doctors about anxiety, um, that you know, might be new information. Um, sometimes there's resistance there too. So there's, you know, I see a similarity there when it comes to, you know, having, you know, the courage to take that information and stand for what you know is true to make a difference in your life. And that can be really hard, but it, it's also really worth it. So. Absolutely. Not only do you get better care, but you're also helping educate the system at the same time. Um, yeah. Another question before we break, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. You're trying to get ready to go. You still have a full coaching schedule, a therapy, you know, all those things. So very happy that you take the time to do this and raise awareness. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the viewers or that they might find helpful in their quest of dealing with Lyme? I think that, um, you know, the most important thing is to protect yourselves against, against ticks. Um, a lot of a lot of people are leery to use a bug spray um but what i want what i want to do is encourage you to look into what's needed to kill a tick or to dissuade a tick um, do your own research and, and figure out what you want to use but please please use something um, don't have your kids going out into a place where there might be ticks or long grass or anything without putting something on them or yourselves you know have like, you know, long sleeves, long pants, tuck them into your socks, do, do everything you need to do to, to keep yourself safe in an area where you know that there might be ticks. Um, people are often resistant to do this. I don't, I don't really understand why, but what I do know is that if they were to become sick, like I am, or their child would be, they would wish that they had put on the spray or they had tucked in their socks or their pants or, or what have you. So I certainly wish that I had been more careful. I don't remember being bit, but I know that I wasn't taking precautions. And so I think that it's just something that's really, really important. And I would encourage everybody to just, just have a look and, and make choices based on what, you know, what they're, they feel okay with, but to, to be aware and take those precautions. Mm -hmm. Now, ticks just aren't out in the, you know, the country somewhere, in the forest somewhere. They're in the city too, aren't they? 
Yes, they are. And actually, many, many of the people that I have talked to and met that have gone to Germany, like I have, are from cities. So um, yeah, it, it kind of surprised me when I started to meet people and, and find out how many were from cities, because I'm from a, I'm from a pretty rural place, about as rural as you can get. And you know, there are thousands and thousands of ticks in my yard every year. Um, so I was surprised when I met so many people from the cities, but they are everywhere. They're carried by birds and other animals. And so if, if you live a in a place where there are birds, you live in a place where there are ticks. So simple as that. <laughs> yeah, well, lots of good information, Sherry. Again, I can't tell you how appreciative we are that you take the time to do that and, and to raise your story for the sake of those who are struggling or maybe struggling in the future. Um, of course, we're all praying for you, wishing you the best. Uh, and I know a good friend of yours had to almost twist your arm to get a GoFundMe page because you don't like you know, other people, you know, helping you out there, but they did twist your arm. You do have a GoFundMe page. So uh, for those who are interested in helping in raising awareness, they can go visit your page. And again, we're going to post that link at the end of this video. So thanks again so much, Sherry. Really appreciate it. Uh, before we go, do you have any, any other things you want to share? Any questions at all? No, I just want to thank you for allowing me to, you know, share the story because I, it's, it's not in my nature, true, to make things public, but um, I do recognize that it's important. And so I appreciate the opportunity for, to be able to do this in a, you know, context where, you know, I feel safe and this is, you know, with my story. And so um, I just, I think it was a good place to do it. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, well, it, it's our pleasure for sure. And again, we wish you the best, and I'm sure we'll hear about everything, even on your trip. We'll keep in contact with email, but uh, uh, again, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank you.